Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. I'm Renate McNay and I'm here with Jeff Foster. Hi, Hi. Jeff. We just actually finished uh, an interview and we, we kept sitting here and spoke about different things and thought, oh, okay, why don't we record it? <laughs> so, <laughs> Jeff, there's one thing I would like to dive into a little bit more is um, you talk about in your book that and the sentence is, all the spiritual bypassing stuff we do sometimes. <laughs> so what do you mean by that? Spiritual bypassing, well, you, the way we can use you know, these beautiful spiritual concepts, you know, there's no me, there's no you, there's no time, there's no space, to actually avoid um, feeling what we feel, you know, to, to actually deny or avoid or try to push away mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the messiness of life, the, the, the pain and the fear and the doubt, you know, and, and I, I, I'm guilty of this. I used to do this so much, you know, especially when I got into um, the uh, non-dual teachings, Advaita, you know, there's no me, there's no you, there's no time, there's no space. And I, mean, I, I give a few examples in the book, and you know, one classic example, I'll never forget this, and my, my father will never let me forget this, but... <laughs> When uh, this is this this genuinely happened, you know, a few years ago, I remember my brother asked me to do the washing up because the the dishes <laughs> were dirty, and I, I I this is what I genuinely said to him. I said I said Barry, who who are you asking to do the washing up? You know, and I, I mean it's it's kind of funny now looking back, but I was deadly serious. You know, I, it's like I had lost that basic human connection. I couldn't even hear. I mean, I, I was quite an extreme version. You know, I was quite an extreme <laughs> character, but uh, I, would, I just thought I was using this stuff. I was using... So how did your brother react? Well, I think he was, I mean, he was hurt back then, you know, he, and he was angry and, he, and he, he saw it. He said, Jeff, that's just spiritual nonsense. You know, of course you're a you, of course you're a person. And, you were just trying to avoid doing the dishes, and I was like, <laughs> you know, I, I was, I was like, oh God, he's, you know, he's, so, he's so unenlightened. He doesn't realise, you know, he doesn't realise there's no one here, and, you know, and who is he getting annoyed at? It's all his projection. It's all his. He thinks he has a belief that the washing up needs to be done. <laughs> oh, poor, poor, bro you know. And I, I, I mean, it's funny in a way, but I, I also I see the arrogance of it as well. I, I, I really do, and. Um, and I, I guess I guess I was innocent in a sense as well. I couldn't help it. I, mean, I, I was I was stuck in that stuff back then. I, I was stuck in it. But I mean that's an extreme example. But you know, I had once I interviewed a woman, Suzanne Foxen, who actually got realised why she was washing the dishes. There you go. It's all about the dishes. <laughs> what the <a> potential <laughs> <laughs> for your brother. <laughs> I have to say I did I did learn how to do the dishes in the end. So I do yeah. these days. I do do the dishes. Mm -hmm. I do do the dishes. But that, I mean that that's. Uh, that's kind of a funny and um, extreme example, but yeah. I mean, there's, this happens in so many way, in ways, in much in subtle ways as well. I know. I mean, I used to use it in, in relationships, you know, with like with, with my partner, you know, and where she would be. Um, and, I mean, this was many years ago. I don't do it so much anymore. I hope, but <laughs> <laughs> I've learned my lesson. But um, you know, like my partner would she would want to express something to me to express some frustration, or some sadness, or, or some disappointment you know, with me, something that I had said or done or, you know, and, and I think years ago, because I was so stuck in this non-duality stuff, there's no me, there's no you, it's all a projection. I mean, that's dangerous stuff in a way because there's such a truth to it, but I think the moment you start using it, you use, you use it to win an argument or you use it to prove something, you know. So it, it's no longer a fresh moment, um, present moment insight, it's become a belief, it's become a con it's become a religion, and, you, and you use it, and yeah, another story. It becomes mm. a story. Even the insight that you're beyond stories becomes your new story. And then I, I, I'm guilty of this. You know, I, um, it took me a long time to really see this in myself and see the subtle ways that I was doing this. Like I wasn't, um, like I, w I wasn't allowing my partner just in the moment to feel what she felt because I was taking it personally. You know, I, I was taking it. And that's, that's the ironic thing, I was taking it personally, and then so I was saying, well, there's no one here. You see, it's very clever. Like, yeah. so, so she would express some, say, some, some sadness, or, 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 yeah, or some frustration at something that I'd said, something that I'd done or hadn't done. Um, 
And instead of just being with her, instead of just sitting with her and allowing her to experience what she was experiencing in the moment, you know, and, and like validating her experience, instead of validating her present moment experience, I would go off into my spiritual stuff, you know, and try and um, try and make sense out of it, or, or, or I would, oh, she, she's just projecting, or, or um, what she's saying doesn't apply to me because there is no me. You see, it's very slippery, you know, yeah. and I, I was, um, I think I was doing this in very subtle ways as well. It's just, it's just, it was avoiding. It was all about avoiding um, direct human contact. It, the whole thing. It was. I was, and I, I used all the spiritual stuff because the mind will use anything to avoid life. Mm -hmm. It will use anything to avoid life. So you know, and I was. So I was talking about love and acceptance and unconditional love, and 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 yet I wasn't living it. Like in in the moment, the moment I turned away from my partner, the moment I, I invalidated her experience, or the, the moment I, 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 I cut the connection, I stopped listening to her, then it was all empty, all, all the preaching about there's no me, there's no you, there's no time. It, it all became empty words then, yeah. and it didn't, but here's the thing, it didn't work for me. Didn't work. What, what does that mean? Well, it didn't give me what I really longed for, which yeah. was connection. Yeah. Mm. So all the, the spiritual bypassing, all the, the non-dual cliches and the no one here, no one there, no time, there's no me, there's no you, it's all, it's all yeah. ego, and blah, 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 blah. But in it a way, it's, in, it's interesting, Jeff, uh, because um, you are talking about this in your book, how when you were a child, and you know we, we all experienced that, mm. that your parents didn't validate your experience when you were a child, when you were sad, they tried to make, pull you out and make you happy because you said your father couldn't really sit with you when you were sad. You know, you, in a way you did the same thing with your girlfriend. I think, I which think, the yeah. Parents, your parents, no, which you learned from your parents. And this is karma. This is karma. So talk more about <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was in the Bible it says that the sins of the fathers will be passed through, um, what was it? Anyway. Passed, passed down through, through the seven generations sure. or something. It's, yeah. we, I, I don't think I was alone in having that experience of not being validated. I, I yeah. think everyone experiences this. That's I think right. it's, it begins when we're very young. I'm not, and I'm not for one moment judging my parents, blaming them. They were doing their best. This was, you know, the, uh, they loved me in the way that they could. Yeah. They loved me exactly in, in the way that they, that they did, in the way that they could. Um, but this is this is what we learn, you know. We, we, when we're, we're young children, and I think I think I give this example in the book. Maybe I don't, but you know, for example, when I was um, a very young child and I was in I was in pain, you know, I hurt myself and I was in a lot of physical pain. My my mother, because she loved me, because that was her her way of showing love. That's what she had learned. She would immediately like try and do something about it, you know, take the pain away, make it better for me. Or if I was Sat, and it wasn't just my mother, my father, it was, I mean, it was everyone that I met. You know, this is what we do to each other. We, you know, if someone's sad, we try to make them happy. If they're yeah, in pain, we yeah. try to take away the pain. I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's, it's yeah. natural, and there's nothing wrong with trying to take away someone's pain. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, um, what it so easily can start teaching them, and what we so easily start teaching our kids is, is, is that, look, I. I, I'm not able to be with you in your pain. I don't know how. This is what I learned that mother, father, and then everyone else, they were not able to be with me. And that was always my question deep down, I think. is like, I think this is everyone's question is who can be with me? Who, who is able to just sit with me in my pain, in my sadness, in my fear? Well, you even could it with your, couldn't, couldn't do it with yourself. Well, exactly, because I, I, I never learned how to. That's I mean, right. in a way, and then, and then we. We grow up and we're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old and we still don't know how to sit with ourselves when discomfort arises. Pain, fear, sadness. Mm. We, we've just never learned how to be with our experience without pushing it away, without running away from it, without trying to numb ourselves to it. And I mean, there's a section in the book on addictions and that's really the root of addictions is this attempt to run away from the discomfort of existence, to run away from discomfort and, mm -hmm. and numb ourselves somehow. And 
But the point is it doesn't work, that it doesn't really give us what we long for. Running away from our present experience doesn't give us what we long for. So, I mean, really, I think that's, that's the one thing that I do with people these days. It's, I mean, it's quite simple what I do, really. And it's not so much a doing, it's really I, I um, invite people to stay with whatever they're experiencing, even if that becomes very uncomfortable. You know, even if that becomes, that can be a very strange place to be is, um, you know, to, to sit with discomfort, to sit with fear, to sit with pain, you know, because, you know, what, what you'll end up meeting in yourself then is, is this the urge to escape. Yeah, but there's also something, if you really have the courage, and I'm talking about my own experience here, yeah. to, uh, to drop into this acceptance, mm. and you automatically drop if you don't tr try to do something. There is, right in the middle of this discomfort and pain, incredible beauty, or I would mm -hmm. say, in your words, the ocean. That's it. It's, yeah. um, even in the midst of the most intense discomfort, you're absolutely right, there's somehow However intense it is, however uncomfortable it is, it, it's it's You're being held. It, it is it is it's already being held in the yeah. moment. You don't yeah. have to hold it. You do not have to know how to hold it. I think that's the maybe that's the core question that goes to the root of all our seeking is how do I hold this? Yeah. How do I hold it? And maybe it's not even a question of how. Maybe you've always been. Maybe you have always been holding it without even knowing that you were holding it. I mean that that's how. Um, indestructible you are. Yeah, and you, you talk about um, it's the deep rest in the ocean we are longing for. You know, we are all tired of running around, of seeking, of being addicted yeah. to seeking and to other stuff and it's to exhausting. our emotions. We are exhausted. Yeah. yeah. I, and, you know, I, I, I remember we did once years ago, uh, Ian, Ian and I, a weekend with uh, Sogal Rinpoche, Rinpoche. That's when his book came out, the Tibetan book of, of dying. Yeah. And the way he started the weekend was, we are all exhausted. <laughs> we are all exhausted of the constant circles of life and being lost in it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's true. I never forget that. Uh, and as you say in the book, that's we are longing for this deep rest. Mm -hmm. We only can find in the ocean. So and true. we go on holiday, and we do that, <laughs> and we do that, and that's what you call is just the. Condition, so conditional, the conditional con rest. Conditional rest. Yeah, I'll go off and I'll have my rest, and then I'll come back to. But it's. Um, it's so true. So many people that I meet are, are just exhausted. Mm -hmm. You know, they're exhausted and they're looking for a way out of that exhaustion and then exhausting themselves trying to get rid of the exhaustion. So it becomes yeah. even more exhausting. Yeah. I think there's, but there is, I think there's such a profound truth in exhaustion though. I don't think even, I don't think even the, I don't even think the exhaustion is a mistake because it, it could be so easy then to make exhaustion into the new enemy. You know, it's, you're supposed to be exhausted. The seeking is supposed to be exhausting. It's supposed to exhaust you, mm. you know, because ultimately what we're looking for on the deepest level is something we will never find in the world, in, in the circumstances of our lives, in, in the world of time and space. You know, we're looking for something we'll never find, you know, and it, however much money we make, however many enlightenment experiences we have, it doesn't satisfy, you know, it's, it's what we're looking for that point one day I will be totally satisfied. That's, that's the seeker, that's the voice of the seeker. Mm -hmm. One day I will reach, in time, because it's always in time with the seeker, one day I will reach the point of completion. So I, I, I strive to get there, I, I make mo more money, money, fame, wealth, success, power, what, what will it take, you know? And, and then I try the spiritual stuff, more enlightenment, more awakening, higher levels of consciousness, more, 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 further, 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 bigger, bigger, bigger. And it, it doesn't deliver. The mechanism, it's almost perfectly designed to never, never quite deliver what you long for. 
Because you, know, you finally, you get the money, or you have the big enlightenment experience, the, the, the bliss, the, 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 you, you, you enter the state of pure bliss, and it's wonderful. All the, these are experiences, they're wonderful. But it's, it's a world of impermanence, you see. It's a world where nothing lasts, and we know it. We know it. it it's a world where you can lose what you have. Um, so we, we get the money, it satisfies for a while, we want more. Or we fear losing it, so it's both, you know. We want more of what we have, or we fear losing what we have. And no one has ever escaped, no human being has ever escaped that. And so yeah. from one perspective, that's the tragedy of life. From one perspective, yeah. that's the tragedy. You will lose everything. Yeah. If, if not, you know, if, if not um, now, then at the point of death, it's all stripped away. It's all stripped away. Your success, your achievement, your money, your power, your fame, even your, the memory of yesterday's enlightenment, yeah. however beautiful it was, it's stripped away, stripped. And on some level, we know it, but we're looking for our salvation. We're seeking salvation in a world of impermanence, which is, it's, it's designed, it's almost like it's perfectly designed to never satisfy. It's almost like it's perfectly designed to exhaust you. But that's, I, I always get very excited when I meet people who are totally exhausted and they're the, the, the point of total despair mm. you know, because they, they say this was supposed to do it for me, this was supposed to complete me, the, the money, the power, the fame, the, the, the relationship, the, 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 the guru, the enlightenment experience, this, this was supposed to, it was supposed to do it and it, and it hasn't and I, there's like there's this disillusionment, I'm, I'm, I've meet, I meet so many, especially these days, you know, 2013 and all that. Um, so many people are disillusioned with all the promises, the material promises and the mm. spiritual promises. Mm. So this is, this is very exciting in a way because if we, can, if we can see the profound truth that's actually contained within the disappointment, within the despair, and if we can actually find a way of turning towards our exhaustion, turning towards our despair, turning not away from it, not to try and medicate it away or meditate it away, not to judge it or numb ourselves to it, but to face it. What's, what's the message? What, what's, what's this saying? What, what's the secret contained within our despair? And the secret is, it's not about, life isn't about getting there. It's not about getting there, it's about here. It's about where you are. And it always has been, and, and of course fighting Fighting this moment will become exhausting. It's trying to wake you up. Like it's, it's, almost like, uh, it's almost as if the whole thing is perfectly... I can see why people believe in God. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's too, it's too <laughs> ingenious, it's too creative. You know, it's almost you, the mind wants an explanation. But I think just to, just to appreciate the infinite creativity of, of the whole thing, like the, this perfect setup, it's like not... Um, that your story will never be complete. That's what, that's what we're all trying to do, is complete our story. We, we want the Hollywood ending to our, the story of my life, to become the perfect, you know, and, and then he became the perfect being, and then the story perfect ended. Perfect way. Yeah, yeah. There is the point where it's perfect for a second. For a, for a moment, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, want, we want to hold on to that. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the joy of life, and it's, that's the despair of life. Yeah. The, the, the joy of the wave reaching the peak and then the mm. utter, de in a moment, the utter despair of knowing mm. it's gone and it may never come back. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the tragedy of life from, from one perspective is, um, you know, trying to hold on to that which we know will pass. Mm. Trying to hold on to that which we know will pass. So we're, we're, look, we're seeking, we're seeking in all the places where we can't find what we're looking for. It's almost perfectly designed. I'm not saying it's designed, it's, it's almost as if it's perfectly designed to mm -hmm. never actually provide you with what you truly long for, which is yourself. The whole, it's almost designed to, to, to fail, the mechanism is designed to totally fail. Which, and in that failure, it's like that failure, when, when it's faced, it throws you back on yourself. The, the, the ocean that you seek, it's not out there, it's, it's like a wave seeking the ocean, right? You know, and the wave, forgetting in the beginning, forgetting that it is the ocean mm -hmm. and identifying as a wave separate from the ocean. It goes out and where is the ocean seeking the ocean, exhausting itself. So this poor, ex you have this poor exhausted wave 
I was With like, completely on its own in on the its world. Own, <laughs> I, I will never find the ocean. Yeah. Everyone else is finding the ocean, you know. <laughs> He's done it and she's done it, but I will never find the ocean. Mm. I'm completely exhausted of failure, despair. Hallelujah. I mean, hallelujah. This is Jesus on the cross. This is Jesus on the That's cross. True. Yeah. But in the midst of that exhaustion, the midst of that despair, who you are is fully present. So that maybe, I mean, so many people ask me, what's the point of suffering? What is the point of, you know, is suffering, is it a mistake? Is it some kind of cruel joke? You know, if there's only the ocean, why do we suffer? You know, it's such, it can seem like such a paradox. Mm -hmm. If there's only oneness, why do we suffer? But what I would say is that suffering is an invitation to remember. You know, and, and I'm always reminded of um, Jesus on the cross. I think it's such, whether you believe it really happened, whether you believe in, whether you call yourself a Christian or not, I think it's, it's a beautiful, powerful um, metaphor for the human condition. You know, we're, we're all on the cross, actually. It's not, it wasn't this guy called Jesus who was crucified one day. We're, we're all on the cross right now. Yeah, yeah. And the, cro the, the crucifix is the present moment. And, uh, I mean, just, just, just imagine it. You know, this, this, this man, Jesus, was, he's nailed to the cross, you know, with no hope of escape. I mean, he's nailed. No hope of escape. Far away from his loved ones. He can't, he can't, he can't even touch his loved ones anymore. Yeah. You know, intense pain, the kind of pain that we couldn't even imagine. Yeah. You know, his, his, his body broken, blood everywhere, you know, bones broken, you know, ridiculed, being ridiculed and, and, and you know, his, his whole story is being destroyed with no hope of escape, you know, and, but right in the midst of that, this is the thing, right in the midst of the, the very, the human imperfection, I mean, talk about imperfection, talk about the unfinished story of our lives. You know, this wasn't how it was supposed to end, or maybe it was. But this certainly doesn't match our idea of perfection, right? <laughs> you not, know? not for Jesus not anyway. For, no, no, no. <laughs> no, and uh, the thing is, it, it was right in the midst of that, that this deep acceptance was discovered. Yeah. The deep acceptance was, wasn't, wasn't far away. It seemed like, for a while, it seemed, it seemed like it was far away, you know, and Jesus cries out, um, Father, have you forsaken me? Why have me? you forsaken me? Yeah. For, and then, for, sorry, go on. But then, thy will be done. Exactly. Yeah. You know, he, he forgets who he is. He's a human being. And I, I think this is so beautiful as well because I mean, when you're a spiritual seeker and you're going to become enlightened and, and, and you know, you've got very, very, very high standards, mm -hmm. incredibly high standards for yourself. You won't even allow yourself a moment of doubt. You won't allow yourself a moment of forgetting who you are. Eve, come on, even Jesus on the cross forgot who he was. And he, <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. It's like there's, there's hope. <laughs> there's hope for everyone. You know, we don't have to be this perfect being who never doubts. Do you know what I mean? Who never feels despair. Who never feels even the Son of God. I mean, in the in the mythology, mm. even the Son of God forgets God mm. for for a moment. You know, and he cries out, why have you forsaken me? And then he forgets who he is. He's forgotten him. He's identified with the wave. Yeah. He's yeah. identified with the despair, with the pain, with the yeah. failure, with, with the body, with death. He's identified with that yeah. for a moment. And, he, he, and then, then he feels so far away from God. Mm -hmm. He feels so far away from who he is. He feels so far away from acceptance. Why have you forsaken me? Yeah. Consciousness, why have you forsaken me? And then he remembers, oh, I am that. Yeah. And then it's done. Yeah. It's done. But it, it's done on the cross. He didn't escape the cross. No. So that's the, that's the perfect integration, you see, of absolute and relative. The absolute wasn't separate from, from the relative mess. Of, that's a mess. It's a big mess. Talk yeah. about, but it's a divine mess. Yeah. You see, we, let's just face it, our lives are a mess, right? But they're supposed to be. It's supposed to be a mess. You're not supposed to be living the perfect life. What would that even look like? What would that even mean? Well, you know, Jeff, um, 
most of the spiritual teachers and gurus, they, they show us a completely perfect, enlightened being. You know, I, 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 I don't think I remember ever hearing somebody like you saying, yeah, I've, I'm in a mess and I still have these naughty thoughts and I'm still doing that and that. You know, you don't hear anybody admitting that. They all have a hello or hello. hello. Or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, we take them as a kind of heroes. Mm -hmm modern day heroes and we want to be mm -hmm. like them and we them. even we even forget more and more ourselves mm -hmm. in that process trying to become somebody else trying to become some someone else yeah. it, it becomes this unreachable goal mm. you know and, and I, I can't um i don't want to judge anyone you know i i i can only look at my own experience and years ago when i was pretending to be perfect you know i really was back in the um you know, I won't do the dishes because well, there's no one here to do the dishes days. That's, that's, you know, the cover on your book, the completely perfect, the perfect ocean. flat ocean. <laughs> well, and the, the thing is, there is a, there is a beautiful, profound truth. And nobody truth. there. Nobody there on the yeah. bench. There, again, there's a beautiful, profound truth to that. You know, yes. from, from the perspective of the absolute, yeah. um, there's no problem. From the perspective of the ocean, mm. In a sense that there is a kind of perfection, uh, so because no, no, what, no matter what happens, you know, to the waves, the ocean can't be touched. The ocean is untouchable in that sense. The ocean is um, can't be destroyed. It's ever present. It can't be touched. Um, but this is this is the thing, you know. So easily that becomes the new identification. I am the ocean. I can't be touched. No. Yeah. No, 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 you are Jesus. Yeah. You can be touched. Yeah. You can be crucified. You see, and that's, that's the paradox. You are, as, as consciousness, you are untouchable. As a human being, you are absolutely touchable. You're moved by everything. You're touched by everything. You're, you're open and sensitive, and you feel everything, and yeah. nothing can touch you. And they're both true. You see, I think, in my fantasy, <laughs> the ocean and the wave have to meet in the human heart. I think so. And that is the complete human being. I think so. That's God living this life as a human being. Mm -hmm. And if that's missing, I mean, the mind is more and more expanding into higher realms and mm -hmm. more non-dual states and absolute whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, the, and as I said before, you know, the beauty of it is Life won't let you get away with any um, fixation, any, any, anything fixed, anything solid will be washed away. Mm -hmm. It can't stand, you know. So you identify as this perfect spiritual being who never feels this and never feels that wonderful. That's your conclusion about yourself. You know, you might believe that about yourself. You might want others to believe that about you. Wonderful. There's not a judgment about that, but you will suffer. Mm -hmm. You know, that, and that's um, it's not a punishment. It's an invitation. Yeah. So I think that I think it, um, I'm I'm grateful in a way that for whatever reason I was always always open to looking at my own suffering and, and it's as it got more and more subtle and subtle and subtle you know I I, I was a I was I was a genius at suffering I mean I was like the world's greatest sufferer I could suffer <laughs> over anything any time any moment to yeah suffering. I mean the most I. The most, it was astonishing to, to see it, that the tiniest little thing would keep me up all night. You know, I mean, it would, it would destroy me. I, 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 <laughs> so I understand stuff, I understand the mechanism of it, you know. I, yeah. But it, it, it always, 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 for me, I it always, when I was able to stop and see the suffering, I mean, I'd just admit it, stop pretending to be perfect, Jeff. Where does that get you? It just, you know, you, you, so it's, it's an image, the, the perfect being. Yeah. And then you, oh, it's so exhausting. It's, it's part of the exhaustion. You have to maintain that image for yourself and for other people. Look at me, I'm perfect. Look, it's a constant proving, proving, proving. And it becomes exhausting, which is great. Because then if you're honest, you'll notice that exhaustion. And you'll notice that suffering. And you'll become fascinated with that. You become mm -hmm. less interested in the image. Mm -hmm. And more interested in what, what, what in me isn't being allowed. What, what am I still running away from? What? what where am I forgetting who I am? 
you know. Um, so suffering is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's the invitation, you know, and, and it would always let you know what you're still at war, or, at war with, you know, and um, again, I always, I always come back to Jesus on the cross because I, I just think it's so powerful. It's, um, his suffering did not, in the end, didn't lead him away from what he was seeking. His suffering, and his suffering didn't lead him towards it, actually. Oh, it, it, it wasn't first I suffer, then I reach. It yeah. was actually the suffering was a, uh, a present moment invitation. The suffering was, a, was an invitation to remember here and now who I really am. And, th and this is it's so beautiful as well because life is so forgiving in a way, you know, even if every moment is a fresh invitation. I, I love this word invitation. It's like every moment is a fresh invitation to remember. So even if Yesterday, you totally forgot who you were, or the, the whole of last week, you totally, or the five years, or whatever. Still, life gives, you know, there's, there's this moment. And that's the question, do you remember who you are now? It's like, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Okay, but, but now, ah, I remember. Yeah. And somehow it wipes away that's right. the past. Yes. And that's God. And that's God, consciousness, awareness, mm -hmm. being. But I think there's... Um, that's why the, the cross is such a powerful symbol of ways, like this, the, this total intersection, it's the intersection of the, the absolute and the relative, right? There's, as you said, this, the, the human heart right at the center of that, and this beautiful, imperfect, messy human being who doesn't always get things right, who doesn't always feel the right way, who doesn't always have the right experience. But, may, but maybe it was never about that. Yeah. Maybe it was never about being the perfect me, no. the perfectly successful me or the perfectly enlightened me. Yeah. Maybe it was always about remembering, you know, this, this total embrace um, of yourself as you actually are right now, in all your messiness, in your imperfection. You, you know, you're on the cross. It's not pretty. Mm. It's not pretty. But right at the heart of that, there's this words, you know, love, grace. I, it's. So really, I, I, for myself, I don't really have any interest anymore in pretending to be anybody. Anybody, or the, the, you know, the especially an enlightened. The one. enlightened, <laughs> the enlightened teacher. It's so. It's yeah. um, why, why would why would I limit myself yeah. to that image? It feels so limiting. I'm not mm. saying it's right or wrong. I think it's why would you want to limit yourself to. I, I am this thing. Also, you are quite young. I think you are only 30 years. I uh, think I am 32. Right. But I might be wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, this generation who is coming, they need a new teaching. And I guess that's what you're providing. I don't know what I'm providing. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think people are hungry for a spirituality that it's livable. It's livable. Yes. And yes. it doesn't deny our humanity, because yeah. I think our yeah. humanity has been denied for too long. Yeah. So I, I am pure consciousness, I am pure consciousness. Yes, okay, we've heard that so mm. many times, but what does that mean, actually, yeah. in the yeah. moment? You know, when you come home from work, or you come home from your satsang, or you come home from mm -hmm. wherever, and your, your partner's there, and they're, they're upset with you, and they're, you know, they're frustrated, they're sad, you know, what does... What does it mean to be pure consciousness in that moment? Yeah. Does it mean you just tell her that you're pure consciousness? Mm. It's like, you know, sorry, I haven't got time for you. I'm pure consciousness. Or this is, that's all relative stuff. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I, I live in the absolute now. Mm -hmm. What? Is, mm -hmm. that, is that spirituality? Or, you know, I'm so enlightened, love. Yeah. You know, I, I, that's, that's all your projection. I'm, I'm so enlightened, it doesn't, it doesn't touch me. It's, mm. Why are we so afraid of being touched? You know, wh when did spirituality become that? I mean, that's an extreme example, but mm. when did spirituality ever become about becoming some untouchable awareness? It's a good question. It's a very good question. And I think we have to stop now. <laughs> it was great um, having some more time with you, Jeff. You and, too. Um, Thank you. 
Thank you again for watching Conscious TV and thank you Jeff. And he's on to the next interview with Eleonora. Yes, and it never <laughs> <About> stops. <laughs> relationship, no. <laughs> the endless interview. Yes, okay, goodbye. Okay.